want to learn from his godly instruction and example, so that we are stirred up afresh to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and strength and mind, and thereby to do battle for the ongoing reformation of the church, which is a battle in every age, according to the word of God. And this is nothing less than the cause of Jesus Christ himself. This is the one cause and battle that all of us need to fight in all our days. Every other cause, every other battle is worthless because only the saints inherit the everlasting kingdom. And we should all be very clear about this. That Calvinism, the Reformed faith, is the only hope of Christendom. The only hope of the church. To the degree that a church is Calvinistic or Reformed, to that degree it is faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and serving the true and living God. And this is the very reason why other groups have especially hated and attacked the Reformed faith. Think of the Church of Rome. Rome understood, and still understands too, that its greatest threat is not the Lutherans, it's not the Anabaptists, it's not the Arminians. In fact, Rome understood and understands that the Arminians were a fifth column within the Reformed, seeking the destruction of the Reformation. Rome understood that wasn't the number one enemy. It was the Reformed churches. They always knew that. And Rome understood that its number one enemy within the Reformed was John Calvin. He was the man they loved to hate. Towards the end of Calvin's life, when there were some discussions between the Roman Catholics and the Reformed, the Roman Catholics said, John Calvin must not be included in the Reformed camp. We can have Theodore Beza, your number two theologian, and anybody else, but not Calvin. We don't want him to put his feet on French soil. The rest of you can come, we can talk, but he must stay. That was so hard, they hated him. There is, there is information and evidence to suggest that even the Lutherans, particularly as they began to drift, and drift they did, especially after Luther's death, when free will entered into Lutheranism, the Lutherans, as they began to drift, began to fear the Calvinists more than the Church of Rome. And the Lutherans reserved their sharpest attacks, not even for Roman Catholic doctrine, like transubstantiation or free will, but for Reformed doctrine. Some of you may have heard of the late John Gerstner, Presbyterian theologian in the United States. Gerstner was right. Gerstner stated that the various Protestant denominations live off what elements they possess of the theological capital that is the Reformed faith or Calvinism. That's what keeps them going. Whatever degree of that that they have, that's as much life and vigor as they have. And that's why we're praying that God may strengthen us in the truth of his word. So much for Calvin's influence. Let's turn to the first half of his life. The first 27 years. The second half we'll deal with Lord willing. And I hope you're able to come back this day next week. Friday next week. Almighty God according to his eternal decree, was preparing John Calvin for his Reformation battles even before Calvin was converted. That's why we read earlier from Jeremiah chapter 1. There the Lord told Jeremiah, quote, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. 
In other words, as Calvin puts it in his commentary, Before I formed thee in the womb, I, God, destined thee, Jeremiah, for this work, even that thou mayst undertake the burden of a teacher among the people. Calvin continues his commentary by drawing the following principle. Quote, God chooses every single individual according to his own will and fits them for their work. This fitness is the gratuitous work of God. And this applies to absolutely all of us who are in Jesus Christ, that God decreed our salvation and fitted us for our work and calling in the church. And this applies to Calvin himself. Fitted by God for his extraordinary labors and usefulness as a teacher in Christ's church. Here you need to say that Calvin, of himself, was a filthy, hell-deserving sinner. And nobody knew that better than Calvin. And that comes out in his prayers and humility. But it was God's eternal predestination and grace which converted and made Calvin a servant of God's glory in Jesus Christ. All that before Calvin was born. On the 10th of July, this day, 500 years ago, he was born in Noyon in Picardy in northern France. That's near the Somme, where so many would die four centuries later. Or again, Noyon is about halfway between Paris and the Belgian border, if you could picture that. Calvin's family and religious upbringing were devoutly Roman Catholic. His father, Gerard Calvin, or Covin, he wasn't a priest, but he was a cathedral notary and registrar in the ecclesiastical court. With his father's help, by the age of 12, Calvin was employed by the bishop as a clerk. And he received the tonsure as one dedicated to the service of the church. The shaving of this part of the head. Calvin's father was very ambitious for him. He wanted his son to rise <coughs> to high office in the church. And so off went Calvin to university. He studied at three French universities. Paris, Orléans, and Bourges. At Paris, his first university, Calvin received a solid general education, some Roman Catholic theology, a good grasp of Latin, being taught by a superb Latin teacher, Maturin Cordier, and he graduated MA, Master of Arts. Then, with his father having some problems in the Roman church, he was eventually excommunicated for some financial impropriety. Calvin's father directed his son to study law. I've fallen out of the church. I don't want you to be a minister in that church, therefore. But I do want you to have a high, highly paid and creditable job. Law. There's lots of money in law. There was then and there is now. So Calvin left Paris and went to Orléans and Bourges to study law. In Bourges, he also learned Greek from a very capable German scholar called Melchior Volmar. And you see even in this, how God is preparing Calvin for his life's work even before his conversion. He's not a Christian yet. God is teaching him through these human means, theology and law, two subjects well equipped to make a person a rigorous thinker. He's learning Latin. Latin to us is a dead language, but it was the language of scholarship in Western Europe. You wrote a book in Latin in the 1600s, anyone who, who was learned could read it, and so your ideas could be disseminated far and wide. And Calvin's grasp of Latin is masterly, and his French also was superb, and he perhaps...